Good evening, everybody, and welcome to this Cast Albums Recordings session. I'm so delighted to see everybody here on YouTube, um, and it's wonderful to be here with our lovely panel of very distinguished guest speakers. Um, this has come out of, uh, actually originated with a conversation with Broadway Records, who were very interested in what's going on with new musicals in the UK. Um, so it was that conversation, along with many of our members at, at MMD, um, being so enterprising and brilliant during the past year and getting cast albums together despite everything. Um, so we were so so impressed and delighted with what's going on and also aware of the many members who um, you know, wanted to know more, wanted to hear about how people are doing this. Um, so we're here tonight to discuss uh, all of these, these um, issues around getting cast albums together, getting them recorded, getting them distributed. Um, I'm Emily Gray from MMD, by the way, I should have started with that. I'm very excited to, to see everyone. It's our first panel of the year, so um, a happy 2021 to everyone as well. Um, and we're going to meet our panel, um, we're going to have a discussion, and then there'll be plenty of time for questions as well. But for the moment, I'm going to hand over to James. Yes, greetings everyone. Thanks so much for joining us. If you're joining us live, so I'm James Hadley from Musical Theatre Network, and if you're joining us live, you can at any time write a question for our panellists. Uh, just put it into the chat in YouTube and start the question with the word question in capital letters so we don't miss it. Uh, and then we'll, Emily and I will pass it on to our panellists when we get a chance. Don't wait until we get to the questions stage of the conversation. Uh, do feel free to, to put that question in the chat at any point you think about it and we'll come back to it later on. Uh, and if you're watching this uh, later on on YouTube, not live, by all means do get in touch with us if you have further things you want to discuss with either M or MMD or MTN. Just have a look on our websites and all our contact details are there and we can put you in touch with people if, if you have questions after the live event is finished. Thanks so much for joining us and um, without further ado we'd love our panellists to introduce themselves themselves to you. Uh, we have some wonderful expertise uh, in terms of both recording uh, musical theatre uh, cast recordings but also uh, people who have a lot of experience in putting their own work out there uh, on a variety of platforms. There's so many options open to us nowadays. So to begin with I'd like Simon Grief to introduce himself please. Hello, uh, thank you James. Uh, so yes, I'm Simon Grief. Um, I am primarily a theatre director and just over 11 years ago, I created the label Simji Records uh, alongside Simji Productions to help support and champion uh, new musical theatre writing in the UK. And since uh, 2009, um, I've helped to produce many uh, sort of London cabarets and concerts to showcase new writers and new writing. Um, and I produce and directed uh, workshops of new British musicals. Um, and I've helped to produce and release 39 albums to date, uh, which includes uh, composers songbook albums. Uh, so obviously getting new work out there from writers, uh, showing off their catalogue of work. Uh, I've done concept albums, so sort of the next generation of demos become concept albums. I've done concert and uh, studio cast recordings, and then a number of um, small London cast recordings. Um, and depending on the size of the project, uh, I work as the producer uh, to book the studio, to help uh, schedule the recording sessions, uh, often cast the album if the cast isn't already attached, um, I oversee the mixing and mastering process, uh, the artwork process with my regular art director, and then I then release the album on the Simji Records label. Um, and th the first uh, original London cast recording that, that we released was actually the MMD project the review called Beyond the Gate. So that's where it's all, all started for Simji Records. Uh, and the most recent project has been uh, Flowers for Mrs. Harris, the, the wonderful um, Richard Taylor and uh, Rachel Wagstaff musical, so which, I'm, which we're very proud of. Um, so, yeah, so that's a little bit about me. As I say, I'm primarily a theatre director, but I um, dabble in, uh, in, in recordings in an effort to help and support and nurture writing in the UK. So that's me. So let me hand over to one of our other, other panellists, which is obviously John Yap from J Records. Hi. Uh this is uh, I'm John, John Yap. I um, started my record label in 1979 
with a recording from the King's Head um, Theater of a show called Nashville, New York. Uh, since then, I've done, I think we've recorded over 450 cast albums. Uh, we are very active uh, actually uh, in America. Uh, we, we do a lot of, um, a lot of Broadway and off-Broadway cast recordings, as well as London cast, of course, and a lot of studio cast. Um, uh, we've been very fortunate in that we, um, we, we joined forces with the York Theatre in New York, um, and um, we've recorded about 25 cast albums with them, uh, all sort of new works and new, new productions of real um, um, classic um, worthwhile works and um, and one of my major uh, contributions to the, to the world of recording of musical theater is my series of complete recordings. Uh, I think we're the only one doing this um, a series of complete recordings in that what we do is we treat musical theater scores like opera recordings where we record everything uh, from the very first note of the overture to the last note of the exit music using the original orchestrations. Uh, fortunately for, 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 for us is that we were doing these during the time when it was still affordable to involve a whole symphony orchestra, a whole chorus, stars from Broadway and Western and the opera world uh, because um, uh, uh, there were things uh, they were quite relatively cheap then, but now I think it's impossible for anyone to do all these complete recordings without losing everything. Um, the latest complete recordings that we are enjoying the success of is actually a very old show. It's a Stephen Sondheim um, a show called Anyone Can Whistle. And um, uh, you've just given it the first complete recordings and it's sort of revealed uh, a wonderful aspects of anyone can whistle that now um, uh, people are taking great uh, renewed interest in the work, uh, more like uh, more as a political satire rather than a, a 60s flop. In fact, um, I think I'm going to get a major write up in the New York Times um, any day now because they've been getting in touch with us, getting information. Anyway, so basically, um, uh, 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 our task is to is is to record, preserve, and support the musical theatre, um, and hope to go on for a few more years. Um, hand on to uh, hand over to Poppy. I think Poppy Burton. Hi, I'm Poppy Burton Morgan. Uh, so I'm a writer and director, um, and I don't really identify with the term producer, but actually hearing Simon, I'm like, oh yeah, I book the studio, do the scheduling, do the mastering, the mixing. Oh yeah, I don't do the mastering and mixing, but you know, to oversee that process, the artwork. So I suppose producer as well. Um, I thought I was prolific, and then I hear you guys, I'm like, oh, okay, I've only done five. Um, but I have created um, five cast albums of my show, five of my shows uh, in the last nine months, um, all through lockdown. Uh, so I can speak a bit about that, all the different aspects of that experience. Uh, and yes, the sort of trials and tribulations of doing everything like individual person by individual person. Um, but it's been a great joy. And four of those five shows are brand new musicals that have never had a production. So part of the reason behind doing them is, is kind of putting that out there in part of the developmental stage of the musical uh, and, and hoping, well, already it's the case, you know, people contact me going, oh, I heard your uh, album on Spotify and let's talk about theatres, let's talk about work. So, um, so yes, I'm sure I'll name drop my shows later, so I don't need to name drop them now, uh, but that I'll keep mine super brief. I think that's probably all I need to say. So I will hand over to Van Dean. Hi, um, thank you, Poppy. Um, I'm Van Dean, uh, president and co-founder of Broadway Records. And uh, we started in 2012. Uh, we've released about 250 albums uh, since then, uh, including uh, 49 releases last year during COVID. So we're we're very uh, very active, uh, you know, in this time, and have found ways to uh, be very um, productive during a, a very challenging time, and in all sorts of ways, uh, from home and remote recording to COVID standards in certain places, and everything in between. So we've, we found ways uh, to help artists uh, get their work out there during this time. And you know, we've been very grateful to be able to do that. Um, I'm also 
a uh, Broadway producer of 13 shows. I've done one West End and six national tours in the US. And uh, on the uh, album side, we do all types, but uh, a lot of Broadway cast albums such as Matilda and Anastasia and The Color Purple, which uh, we got the Grammy for. Um, did some revivals like uh, Fiddler on the Roof and My Fair Lady and Once in Island. Um, and we do a lot of work with uh, up and coming writers, emerging writers also, uh, including uh, two new albums, Willow and Over and Out that were just featured in the New York Times um, about this uh, new writing uh, team uh, led by uh, Morgan Smith and uh, what they've created called the Averno Universe where they have an interconnecting world of musicals, which is really exciting. Um, so we're, we're big on supporting uh, new writers, uh, you know, wherever we can and uh, have been particularly active this last year doing that. Uh, I've done a bunch of concept recordings, um, have a, a bunch more scheduled for this year, um, in addition to Broadway, Off-Broadway, um, and uh, some solo artist records too, and composer albums and, and the like. And uh, I think that pretty much sums it up. Great, thank you so much. Lovely to hear from you all. And we do have Vicky Stone joining us as well, um, probably in about 15 minutes. So we'll hear from Vicky as well. Um, but to, to come to our sort of our, our first question panel, um, we would love to hear more from you about some of the very specific circumstances of your most of one of the most recent recordings. And I guess it's it's so interesting to hear what the challenges are and how how our world has changed. And you know, we know we may be in this situation for a lot longer. Um, so I wonder if I wonder if I could go to Poppy first. Would that be all right? Just to give and then we'll of we'll course. hear from the other panelists as well. So yeah, um, well, maybe I'll talk about the, the most, our most recent release, which is um, In the Willows, which is a hip hop musical version of Wind in the Willows by Kenneth Graham. Uh, this is where I had to name check my two uh, writing partners, Pippa Cleary and Kieran Merrick. Check them out. They've also got lots of other things on Spotify. So that was um, a really tricky process for us because, well, it wasn't tricky, but it was a joy. But we were sort of simultaneously workshopping the new orchestrations in because this is the show that's had a full production it did a massive tour in 2019 um but we spent sort of most of last year doing quite big kind of structural and like tonal rewrites uh and so we've just released a, an ep a studio cast ep it's just just six songs from the show three of which were from the original production uh and three of which are brand new so and the the challenge with that show is that it fuses kind of hip hop beat led score and um, classic musical theater epic show tunes score. And there were two composers bringing really different sound worlds. So two composers and then four orchestrators. So part of the like purpose of doing that Carl's album was to find the orchestrational kind of sound of the show and unify these quite disparate sound worlds. Um, and for any of you go and check it out on Spotify and other streaming platforms. Um, but for any of you who've heard it, you'll know that the six songs we've chosen show the full, you know, there's a grime number and there's a kind of gospel ballad and everything else in between. Uh, so we had, a, it was a real, I mean, we, we meant to release it last year and the process has taken so long because there was so much back and forth of, should we cut the strings there? Do we, shall we bring a DJ in to scratch some of those horns and kind of unify those sounds, which, so there was so much back and forth. And of course, if you're in a shared space doing it together, that can be a quite quick process. But when you have such a large team with so many people and you're doing it digitally, it's it sort of delays and delays and delays. But I'm glad we took the time, super happy with the end result. But of course, it's sort of, you know, we're all freelancers essentially. So you just kind of, it just eats into your time and eats into your time and you go, oh, it's been six months and it's still not out, but it's now out. So go and have a listen. Right, thank you, Poppy. I, I could see Simon nodding there. <laughs> Similar experiences or? Uh, yes, yeah, certainly uh, in these uh, current circumstances, absolutely. Um, I think just before the first lockdown in the UK, before lockdown one, uh, we were planning the, the, a project and then we obviously had to uh, stop that while we went into lockdown and then between lockdown one and two we got into the studio as quick as, as we could socially distancing looking after each other and getting as much down that we could in the studio before we when it then went into lockdown two so so I, I have had a couple of projects being stretched um and, and as poppy said um we've we've had to sort of work remotely much more than I'd, I'd ever done before. So doing notes, you know, uh, in <laughs> via email and, and Zoom sessions um, and, and even recording that way as well, you know, asking people, certainly musicians who brilliantly 
uh, and now singers who all brilliantly have their own home studios of good quality, they can actually submit to us their their vocal or recording stem and then you know with 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 um good engineers we just you, you mix it in and, and and sort it out in mix and mastering um so yes what one of the project one of the um uh, studio cast recordings that we released it's a a biblical family show called gabriel um and it was done it was it was the most jigsaw puzzle of a sh of a recording i've ever done uh we all the ensemble were individually done themselves at home and then, we had to, and, we had to bring, and then we had to look at all the vocal stems, clean them all, politely tune them all, do everything you one needs to because it's all done remotely and you know with that with, with very little assistance. And then, as I said, we did we did the vocals between lockdowns so I could get the individual principal cast members in one at a time, with time in between, socially distant, cleaning or cleaning everything to get all their vocals down. And the piece itself is is um, it's not just a load of solos and duets. It's quite it's a lot of company work. So the patchwork quilt of putting all these voices together, I suppose, mm -hmm. a bit like a radio play, layering them all back together and making them genuinely sound like we recorded it in the same location at the same time. So that was a real challenge. Um, but the other project I, that I, I must mention is, um, is Flowers for Mrs. Harris. And, and I can't take any, well, very little credit for this at all. Uh, Richard Taylor, who is a wonderful, glorious British composer who I've known for many years. And I've actually, as we were discussing Flowers for Mrs. Harris, I realized that I'd recorded with his permission and with, you know, we recorded three of his songs on my, on my earliest albums. And I, so Cindy Records started as a as a, just an outlet for, for, for artists and writers just to get stuff on record. And we released, yeah, three of his songs on my first three sort of solo albums from, from West End artists. Anyway, cut to Flowers Mrs. Harris and he said, well, I, we're going to record it and we're doing it between lockdowns at, back at the Chester Festival Theatre on the stage, socially distanced, and I mean, Mike Walker and Richard, Mike Walker's the sound designer and, and was the engineer, just did a phenomenal job um, socially distancing them all, but keeping it live and real. So it was all in the same space, but it just, it, but of course it felt unusual to do it that way, but they, I mean, they brilliantly did it. And, and I suppose all I can credit is that I was behind the project, wanted it to be part of Synergy Records, wanted it to be released, did everything I could to, to help them finish it, package it, and and try to sell it. Um, so there's my there's my two uh, most recent lockdown stories, and actually one we're in the middle of as well. But once again, we're now in lockdown three, so we're trying to finish that. So I'll, I'll let other people speak, but that that's my lockdown experience so far. Great fun. Thank you, Van. Anything different going on in the states? And then we'll um, come to John. Yeah. A little bit. Uh, first of all, we just had one giant lockdown. We didn't really have phases. Uh, so it's, it's been pretty much locked down since last March. Um, so that's, I guess, one difference. But uh, our biggest project that we've done during this time would be the Hades Town holiday album that we did called If the Fates Allow. And we did that over multiple days and in multiple ways. Um, so for the ensemble parts, uh, well, we did the band first in a large studio where everybody was 12 feet apart and we had separation and everybody who could wear masks, of course, did. Uh, Brass, obviously that's a little harder, but they were even further apart. Um, and then uh, the ensemble did uh, the uh, next day in the studio, um, again, all separated at least 12 feet apart with barriers. And then all the lead vocals uh, were in separate booths in a smaller studio. Um, so there was all the typical protocols that are used these days and temper checks and, uh, you know, uh, masks wearing and, you know, et cetera. And, making sure everybody was, uh, was tested before, um, et cetera. So that one was, you know, uh, since that was such a big project that might've been a little more difficult to do remotely because the band really had to be together and as did the ensemble. And because the three fates that are in Hades Town, the harmonies are so critical. We really felt we had to record them together to do it remote we would have been very difficult. But most of our other recordings or a lot of them uh, have been remote. We have, uh, we purchased a whole bunch of mic kits that we can send around to people that they can hook into their Mac that have, you know, built-in preamps and mics and uh, pop screen and all the, you know, headphones, preamp, et cetera. Um, so that they can record it themselves with our direction. Um, so that's how we've done some of the remote recording. Others we've done the way you heard described where a lot of people do have home studios, especially now 
people have been investing in that. Um, so more and more people have some sort of home setup, which has also been very helpful. Um, so we've utilized that as well. And I actually wanted to mention one thing which is completely unrelated, but applies to everybody on the panel. Um, anybody who has a domestic US release of your recording, uh, make sure you enter your album for Grammy consideration. Uh, if you need any help with that, I can, I can help you do that. Um, but everyone listening and on the panel should know that if you have an album that is released in some fashion domestically, that can even be digitally in the US, then you can submit it for Grammy consideration. Thanks, John. Did you want to come in? Yes, um, I was going to say, actually, for me, the lockdown period was um, was almost got heaven sent, actually, because um, uh, I've done a lot of complete recordings that, that are still in the cans uh, way back. Um, in, so that um, um, only because I've been so busy making new recordings in New York and in London and that that all these wonderful recordings that I have in the cans that drove everybody crazy around the world by not releasing them and not finishing them. One of them, of course, uh, was uh, One Touch of Venus, uh, Kurt Weill, uh, finished that. And The Dancing Years, um, Ivan Novello, the first complete recording of it, that's finished, that's released. But the one that everybody wanted was uh, Anyone Can Whistle, which, um, which uh, I recorded 26 years ago. And um, and it just laid uh, laid in the uh, in the in the vaults um, and um, and finished. Uh, but this lockdown period since March um, gave me the time and and the impetus to get to work on that. And I'm 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 thrilled I did because um, it's a wonderful recording with uh, Julia McKenzie, uh, Maria Friedman, John Barrowman, and uh, and Arthur Lawrence. Um, Arthur Lawrence played the part of the narrator, which is a character in the original version. Um, so um, I, I finished that during, during, uh, from March, uh, almost because there was nothing else to do. And, um, and um, uh, as it turned out, it's, it's heaven sent that we wait, waited all this, all this time uh, to release it because in 2020, the, um, the, the, the story of Anyone Can Whistle is almost identical to what's happening politically and socially in America with Donald Trump and everything else because Cora is, and Donald Trump are basically the same um, characters really, include, including uh, um, uh, reciting and, and, and using the same words like you know, lock them up and um, put them in cages and women and children first you know, all the theaters are dark. <laughs> uh, that's, anyway, um, so the lockdown has been very good. Um, and, um, and I've got another eight or nine complete recordings in the cans that I paid for that cost hundreds of thousands of pounds to make. Uh, anyone can be so cost me about 350 to 400,000 pounds. Then I dread to think how much it will cost now to make, uh, to make a recording with a full symphony orchestra and a full chorus. So um, um, uh, that's, that's been my blessing from lockdown. Uh, during the period, I've also managed to um, uh, spend the time with my engineer to um, uh, we, we found a way to digitally mix two track recordings. I mean, not master mix, you know, um, so um, I, I've, I've actually called it Digimix. Uh, so what I've been doing is I've been taking um, all the old uh, public domain recordings like The Boyfriend and Saturdays and Velmas and things like that and digitally mix them. And they sound absolutely amazing. Uh, it's uh, because uh, all those recordings that were made in the 50s were very badly mixed and badly mastered and badly sort of um, balanced but I've managed to make them sound like they, 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 they were recorded um, just last month. You know? um, and so now we are, we are very busy releasing a whole series of two CD sets because over the years I've, I've done modern recordings of The Boyfriend and Saturdays, Free as Air, Belmouth, 
uh, and a whole, uh, a whole lot Oliver and things like that. So we are releasing them as double double features, uh, two CD packs of our modern recording and the old public domain um, um, recordings digitally mixed. And it's proving to be a huge success because so now we're getting people writing to us asking us when is the next DJ Mix double set coming out. And, and the joy of this is that of course it's renewed a lot of interest in the old uh, British musicals, you know, the, the Saturday days and the free as air and the boyfriend, Belmouth, Oliver. So, so that's what's been keeping us busy this last few months. That's fantastic. Thank you, John. And it's amazing how prolific so many people are being in this area. It's, it does seem like, as you say, there's some silver linings to the situations we're finding ourselves in that can be quite good for, for sort of yeah, clearing out the attic in terms of those recordings that just need the time and space. And I'm sure we're already seeing some questions coming in from people tuning in, but it was going to be my next question was uh, on behalf of all the writers and uh, directors, producers out there, they're listening to this and thinking, oh, I've never done a, a cast recording and I've always thought it'd be great to do, but I've always thought you had to have a huge amount of money and resources for it to be possible. Uh, we know from the things you've described that, that different projects will probably cost hugely different amounts of, of money and it's about different models, different resources that you might access to, to suit that project. Um, so it'd be great to, to now ask each of you to, to tell us a little bit more about one example of a recording that you've been involved in, um, giving us a bit more detail about the kind of resources that were needed to make that possible, to, to give people some sort of insight into to what can be possible. Maybe if we go back to Poppy to begin with, to tell us a little bit more about the scale of maybe one of the recordings that you've made recently uh, and what the sort of resources were that you you've had to, to to use for those what will if you're happy what sort of budget kind of scale you're you're working with for one of those sure i love that i get to go first all the time um i think you just came to me because you know mine are the smallest budgets uh well so we are really lucky i run a theater company called meta theater and we um are frequently get arts council funding for our projects we sit quite firmly in the subsidized sector um for any american viewers there's sort of two strands of british theater kind of subsidized which I, I don't know what the equivalent is about. Anyway, subsidized and commercial. So we sit quite firmly in subsidized. So all of the five projects we've made have only been made possible because of Arts Council funding, basically. Um, and the budgets, but you know, also the thing I would recommend for people out there going, I'd love to do this. Quite a few of ours, we've done a studio cast EP, which is just five or six songs. And I think particularly if it's a new project and it's still in development, that's a really brilliant way of like crystallizing the sound of your show and getting your five or six best songs, which really will be the heart of your show anyway, um, rather than, and obviously that means uh, fewer performers, fewer recording days, a smaller like fee for the person mixing and mastering because it's just fewer tracks. Um, so the whole thing is smaller. So our, <laughs> well, I don't know if I want to give away the budgets, but we ours have ranged from uh, like five or 6,000 pounds to like 20,000 pounds, but it's still, you know, that's still kind of a relatively, you know, compared to the $350,000, we're not in that uh, same league. Um, but I think also that's possibly because uh, we're getting amazing West End performers, but they know that for these new British musicals, obviously we hope they're gonna go on to become like six with its 150 million downloads. Uh, but you know, that that could be like 10 years time. And in those 10 years time, we, you know, other recordings might get made. So I think that a lot of performers, uh, the you know, they're on a buyout and things, but they're probably quite small fees relative to those big Broadway recordings where people know that serious money can be made and therefore they want to sort of be a part of that. I know other people put actors on royalties and you know that's sort of a different model again. Um, but I'd say as a piece of advice, again, if you're doing something at the smaller end of the scale, if you can do a buyout, it just makes the logistics easier because it's such small money that you don't want to get into the admin of going, here's your one pound in Spotify royalties. Um, so yeah, the only other one that's just interesting as a comparison to those, which I'm actually recording the last of this weekend is, um, we got a Arts Council grant to commission a piece from scratch, which we have written and rehearsed, developed and are now recording and will um, release as a, oh, I can't talk about this actually because it hasn't been announced yet publicly. So I won't say too much, but we're filming the whole, um, we're filming music videos of every, it's kind of sung through of everything and then releasing that on YouTube. So the entire project is a kind of 
digital musical, YouTube musical, lockdown musical, uh, which again, so that the budget for that's been a little bit bigger because it includes sort of film elements, but it's a two-hander, uh, that's four. It's a two-hander, which I think uh, obviously makes the whole thing, you know, it's two-hander and a band of three. And again, we, in Britain, we don't have a very strong culture of new musical theatre. Uh, we have a great culture of new writing for straight plays. We don't have a great development culture for new musicals. So the stuff that does get on tends to be, you know, it might still be, epic in its kind of emotional reach but tends to be smaller in scale even playing in the 500 600 thousand seat theaters uh because we we don't take risks and we don't have the same kind of philanthropy here um but so that's re you know even something like in the willows ep those six tracks there are only five or six lead vocalists and most of them are only on one or two songs so they would only be coming in for like an hour and a half recording session, uh, which even on a kind of buyout rate per hour it is quite small. So it's more manageable. It can be more manageable than you think. Over to someone else. Yeah, thank you, Poppy. Should we go to Simon next? Because I know you're sort of, there's there's one foot in that camp and one foot in the more commercial camp. Maybe give us an example yeah. of what, what's a typical, if there, is there a typical SIMG Records recording and the, the kind of resources needed for someone to work with you on? No, not, not really is the truth. Um, I mean, if, for, for me, I genuinely, every project is bespoke is, is what, what are we doing? Why are we doing it? And the saddest truth is, the, the hardest question is, who's going to pay for it? Um, the, the small number of original cast recordings or London cast recordings that I've done, of course, are fringe or very small projects, new musicals that ran a couple of weeks, if that, and then disappeared. And because of their budgets, the original production budgets, very rarely, and certainly with my, from my uh, experience, there hasn't been uh, a recording budget in the producing budgets. Now, obviously, I totally appreciate and understand in commercial theatre, particularly in America, and I'm, I'm absolutely sure Van can, can help here, but it, even in London theatre, there was an opportunity a number of years ago uh, that a, a very dear friend and wonderful writer had a West End show. It was an open-ended run and he happened to pick up the phone and call me and say, how do we record this? And I was like, well, I can tell you how you might. How are you going to pay for it? And he, and he said, well, oh, I don't know yet. And I said, well, is it not in your London producing budget? And he said, oh, no, I don't think so. And for the fact that the lead writer didn't know it was in the budget meant it's not in the budget and the producer hadn't factored in the idea of, of recording to catalogue this the show and so budget was a crazy thing I just couldn't begin to tell him how we could financially make this work and um, to sort of piggyback what Poppy was saying we we are absolutely in a world where the artists in, certainly in the UK the the musicians and the artists are very generous they want to be part of new things they do lend their talents. Um, I, I, as Sinji Records tries to not exploit anybody, I, I'm always honest though, I always say to the writers, who's gonna pay for it? How are we gonna pay for it? How much are we gonna pay people? And so there is a budget to work from. And then I, if we're finding musicians, I reach out to musicians and I say, we've got a session rate. And this is, this is all we have. I, I, and I genuinely reach out to, to, thankfully I've been around long enough, I suppose, to reach out to some great West End people and say, this is the budget, it's a session rate. There aren't any royalties because the truth is we, we're never gonna sell enough units to make the money back. It's all about the love of the recording or cataloging the album so, so it can live on in the audio world. And I suppose in the bigger picture, it could it, people will hear it and maybe want to do the show. Once again, something that Poppy mentioned. If people can't hear it, they're probably not gonna suddenly want to do it. They can read a script or a libretto, but they can't hear that in a script and a libretto. So recording projects it's for me is well me helping and assisting and supporting new musical theater writers it's inevitable so i said well you need to record it the the budget question once again i wouldn't know how to answer other than i do get a lot of wonderful uh, composers and a lot of them mmd um uh, associates come to me and say how do we get this recorded how much is it going to cost and I so say, what is it? Why are you doing it? And don't panic. It doesn't have to cost hundreds of thousands of pounds, depending on what you want it for. A demo can cost very little. If that's all you need to say to people, this is what it sounds like. If you then want to go and sell it, yes, that might be a different story because you want to obviously try and put the bells and whistles on it. But once again, it shouldn't be costing hundreds of thousands of pounds. 
Um, oh, there's there's Vicky. I'm sure you want Vicky to introduce herself. I'll I'll, I'll shut mm -hmm. up for a minute. Yes, welcome, Vicky. Thank you for joining us. We're just we're pausing that question now, and I'll, I'll tell you what we're talking about in a moment, Vicky. But before we introduce you to where we're at in the conversation, everyone else has introduced themselves and just spoken for two or three minutes about their relevant experience of either recording a cast album or involvement in in distributing it. We know you've had a a, a recent really interesting experience with with Zoological Society. So, Vicky Stone, if you'd like to tell us a little bit about you and and, and your experience with, with uh, Zoological Society. Yes, will do. Um, thanks for having me, everyone. Uh, sorry I'm later than I said I'd be. Turns out that I have terrible timekeeping when running a masterclass. Uh, you live and learn. Um, but uh, I, yeah, I released, uh, I released a cast album um, last March uh, called Hashtag Zoological Society. It was a commission uh, by Royal and Derngate. And their brief, um, they didn't commission Zoological Society. Their brief was something that had to work digitally, and they didn't specify what medium digitally. And so I came up with I came up with um, the idea of a concept album, and specifically looking at the old concept albums um, that used to happen in the seventies and eighties, and as a sort of thing that's died. And I felt like looking at the new musicals sort of world in the UK. I felt like new musicals were starting and they were brilliant, but then they wouldn't carry on. And it's it, mainly because there isn't enough resources to make them fly. And so I felt like if I approached this brief from Royal and Don't Get About something that was digital first and, and, and specifically tried to write a concept album rather than a cast album um, to try and like give the show a bit of a flavour and to sort of keep get some life around it and the the original idea was that we were going to have 12 animations to go with the 12 songs but money made meant that we could do two obviously because these things are hugely expensive um but but yeah so that that's my experience i've got a lot more to sort of chip in about the actual process of recording and distributing and how much it cost and what that process was like and how many people were on the team uh, but i won't uh, talk about that now i guess i'll just talk about that as and when so yeah no, that's, that's perfect vicky because so the question we were talking about when you kindly joined us was asking everyone to tell us a little bit about uh, giving all the writers out there some insight into the kind of scale of resources and budgets they might be working with on a project poppy and simon have just shared and i'm now going to hand over to john and then van to tell us about your relevant experiences so so john are you are waiting patiently there you want to jump in yes Actually, I want to contribute towards the um, financing of it and the, um, the, the participation of producers. Actually, in 1983, uh, I went over to New York and I, I think I still am the only British company that straddled both worlds. So I've done a lot of Broadway cast and off-Broadway cast recordings. And I think I'm the only British company that's ever gone over to that side and recorded American cast albums. Usually it's the other way around, it's just Americans coming over here. So I'm still very, very active with uh, recording in New York. But um, since 1983, we're on your toes, um, when no major companies um, wanted to record that wonderful uh, revival, um, I, um, I got, in, got, uh, got in touch with, um, because I was friends with the um, managing director of the Rogers and Hammerstein uh, estate. Uh, office and um, we, we, we uh, got in touch with, well, they got in touch with me actually. And so together with them and with the Kennedy Center in Washington and the New York producers, we, we worked out a way of co-financing the, uh, the cast album. At that time, it was costing over $200,000, $300,000. Um, uh, even then in 1983. Um, and uh, found a way of, um, of, of the producers the publishers, the rights holders, and, and myself, of course, contributing to us to make this cast album happen. And uh, that formula, I think, uh, took hold. And, um, and I think, I believe, when you can conf confirm this, I can actually confirm because I've done quite a lot with Broadway producers and off-Broadway producers where, where they, the, the producers are now, is part of their budget. It's the, it's the American culture where paying for the cast albums is the producers is in their budget. And so basically, unlike the British, British producers where they still expect the record companies to pay for them, 
in America, the, the show producers are now paying for the recordings and then giving the recordings to an independent or to a major label to release. Uh, in my case, because I want to own the master tapes, the rights to them, I offer to take care of a, a, a chunk of the budget. But I don't know about Van, but, uh, but, but that is very much the, the culture now uh, in America. Unfortunately, I think the British producers still have quite a lot to learn about the realities of recording cast albums um, because there really isn't money to be made unless one is a Hamilton or a Phantom of the Opera or Les Miserables. The 99% of cast albums do not make money at all. Uh, and um, it's, for the producers, it's a wonderful, useful tool for them to promote the productions and to promote the afterlife. That's why the, the authors are also very interested in financing and co contributing because if you have a recording, you have an afterlife. Because um, uh, uh, some shows may be 20 years old and because of the recording, it suddenly gets revived or it gets uh, an interest be paid and, 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 then, and then you might have a whole new hit. So, um, uh, just wanted to, uh, to, to add on to Simon's um, um, conversation about financing. Thank uh, you, John. That, that's great. And then Van, there's a nice segue there. Can you tell us about how Broadway Records works and, and the, the sort of approaches that you take to, to working with a recording? Absolutely. And I could also talk about budgets too. Um, so to add to John's point, um, we have been trying to convince producers to include in the budget. Uh, hasn't actually happened very much. What does happen is they will, they, they don't really think about it as early as they should, I guess is what it comes down to in terms of the budgeting side. But when it comes time for that, I usually work with them and we figure out a strategy for them to go back to their partners and investors and see who wants to put in uh, to finance it together. So it's more a subset of the production as opposed to it being like a line item on the original budget, which does mean they have to raise the money all over again. But that being said, um, it's that much less they have to raise when they're just getting the show up. Um, but in my experience, at least, there really haven't been shows that had it built into their show budget. It was tangential or separate from that. Um, but to John's point, it is correct that most of the burden usually falls on them because they're the ones who get most of the benefit because of the marketing, historical licensing aspects. Because as John said, most cast recordings do not make a profit. Um, I think it might be a little bit better than only 1% because you mentioned 99% don't. I think we're, we're definitely higher than that, but it's, uh, it's still a substantial percentage that don't, you know, recoup its entire expense. And uh, because of that, you know, it, it can't be on the record company to pay for it all because we wouldn't be in business very long if we did that. Um, because as, as everybody's said that there's pretty high price tags, at least on the more high profile recordings. And with that in mind, um, so the range is, I'm going to do it in US dollars, but I think the conversion rate is 1.34 today. Um, so, you know, you can do the math, but, um, but in US dollars, concept recordings can go anywhere from like five or $10,000 if, if the composer has the ability to kind of self-engineer it and call in friends and do it really, you know, grassroots up, uh, up to anywhere from say, they tend to average more like 20, 25,000 up to 50 to 100,000. I haven't really seen concept recordings go above that. Um, if they get into the 100,000 range, that's, you know, big orchestra, you know, big cast, uh, pretty large orchestration to pay for, et cetera. So that's really on the high end. Um, I'd say the sweet spot for concept recordings is probably 25 to $50,000. Uh, for off-Broadway recordings, I would say Usually they range, say, 35,000 to 100,000. There's certainly some that fall out of either side of that range, but that would be the majority. Um, most off Broadway recordings we do, I would say, fall between 40 and $75,000. Um, then the Broadway side is a bigger range. Uh, I would say, not counting nonprofits because they can be a little bit less, I'd say it ranges from 200,000 on the low end to four or 500,000 on the higher end. I've seen them go as high as 700 if it's like a double album or a major, major star or some other factor, but that's the outlier. Um, I would say most common sweet spot is probably around three, 350. 
uh, 100,000 um, US dollars uh, for a Broadway cast recording. Um, but you know, it, it can, can be quite a range and uh, hopefully that's helpful to get a picture. Thank you. Yes, thank you, Val. It's slightly overwhelming, those numbers, because we know how so many of our members and in our sector, we're starting from very, very small amounts. But um, so I actually wanted to bring in a, a, a question that we were sent from um, before this, in advance of the session, just to kind of um, highlight some, this area. And um, Jordan Lee Smith has asked it. Well, he said, well, if you're self-producing an album, obviously it's, it's easier for writers starting out, um, but it's harder to promote it. Uh, compared to having a deal with a record company, but when people are starting out, would would record companies like Broadway Records, for example, consider work that has yet to be produced for the stage? Um, you know, how uh, how do, do writers come to you, and um, uh, yeah, are people able to come and ask you to share their work with you? Would you be interested? Um, so it'd be really interesting if you could talk a bit about that that process of the people who are who are really just you know potentially starting out. Um, to we come to you first again, Van? And then, I mean, obviously, it'd be lovely to hear people's opinions on the advantages and potential disadvantages of, of being part of a record label. So we'll come to the others as well. Thank you. Sure. Um, well, I'm a little biased, of course, about the benefits of a record label, but um, but I, I always try to share the pros and cons with writers. Um, I mean, the pros are certainly on the uh, you know promotion and distribution side and also being a part of the catalog. Um, so that people may discover your work because they were looking on the on the website for something else, um, and they made it happen upon your piece that they may not have heard of before. Um, so there's the that basic catalog benefit, but also um, you know the the promotional capabilities that a label would have that an individual may not. Also, any royalties, etc., that have to be paid out when you do it yourself, you're now on the hook basically for the rest of your life to have to pay that if there are royalties. Um, whereas a label is set up to do that. Plus you're having to ship out of your apartment or your home and, and get it to where it needs to go. And it, in the beginning, you might be fine with that, but think about like five years down the road, you still want to be shipping out CDs and, and it's obviously the demand will be less over time, but you still have to manage that. Um, so it's just a matter of, it is a long-term commitment. Um, also we found like, you know, I know a lot of artists who've used CD baby and things like that. And, uh, the economy of scale and the way it works is I would think labels can be competitive, if not better deal financially than a CD baby, for example, because they do take a, a, a middle person's fee as well. And uh, the rates that we can negotiate with Amazon, et cetera, are better than what CD baby will get for the artist. So we do find that financially it's at least equal, if not better to go through say us or one, you know, one of our cohorts on the call um, on the uh, on the Zoom, um, so that we we find in most cases it's better off. But of course, not everything is a fit for a label, and especially if you're really early stages and you're doing an EP and you may decide to, you just want to get it out in the world yourself. And you could always do that and then replace it with a full recording down the road and do that with a label. So there's definitely ways to go. Um, as far as the the big question, I'm sure people want to know about accepting uh, submissions. Um, we do. Uh, if you go to our website and go to the support uh, section we, or contact section, I should say, um, you have a form we can fill out and you can just, uh, you know, tell us a little about your show. And well, you know, if it's, it sounds intriguing, we'll write back and say, well, send us a Dropbox link or something to be able to hear it. And, you know, we'll take a listen and see if it's something we can do. We have done quite a few recordings where it has been self-produced by the artist and we're just getting it out in the world. So we're really acting more as distributor. Um, and we've done that many times. So um, if the work is a good fit, you know, for us, then absolutely uh, we would consider that. Great, thank you. Um, I don't know if we could come to a different view from say Vicky's perspective um, of kind of, obviously you had a partnership um, uh, with your concept album, but you know, how's it gone in terms of getting it out into the world? Good, um, there's, there's a, there's a, we used a, a record label called Auburn, Auburn Jam. So they're very much a UK based, uh, fairly 
new, I guess, uh, record label that lots of people are using in this country. And it means that there's a sort of middle ground between self-distribution self and then also uh, bigger uh, bigger options. And it's been really, really nice because I know it's, I know the two people that run it really, really well. And, you know, you get a lot of, got a lot of control. We also had a PR company that did the launch. But the timing was really, you know, timing was with, with, it, it launched just as all the theatres were shutting down. We we lost our sort of launch concert with a couple of days' notice. So you know, it, you've got all, we had all the wheels in motion. Um, we had all the wheels in motion for a, a bigger launch that, and we just decided to go with it. We decided we decided not to not to pull it. And I think that was the right decision because it's it now lives online. It's just it didn't have quite as big a bigger splash than it might have done. But yeah, I mean, my my experience of working with a, a smaller record label, they also have um, they also have in house studios. So we hired a big we hired a big studio. The thing about this concept album is that actually. It's, we had a bigger cast and bigger orchestra than the show itself has been commissioned for. So the actual stage commission is for five musicians and eight actors, eight performers. And the album has got nine principals, uh, an orchestra of 13, and it's got a chorus of 12 or 16. So there's way more people on the concept album than ever would be in, in the economics of putting the show on. So actually this concept album sounds better, unfortunately, <laughs> Sounds better than it will uh, will on the stage. So there's kind of that aspect as well that's been um, that's been a really interesting interesting thing. And just just to quickly shove in about the in terms of the funding, lots of it came from the Arts Council. So right. it won't recoup because it's come from the Arts Council. Mm. Thank you. I it's going to be so exciting to see that show on stage. So don't don't worry about that. It'll be <laughs> we want to meet those characters. Um, John, did you want to come in there? Yes, I'm. Uh, uh, Basically, um, it is actually a very difficult market at the moment um, for anybody trying to break into the, um, the world market of musical theater recordings because th there, is re there really isn't that traditional um, uh, outlet of shops and, um, and, and even, even, even reviews, uh, 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 print reviews and things like that are now shrinking. A lot of newspapers and publications are no longer reviewing um, uh, recordings. I mean, uh, coming back to Anyone Can Hear So, we are very lucky. Uh, that I'm really waiting with great anticipation for the New York Times review. Uh, it's not been reviewed by the music division, it's been reviewed by the theater critic. And because he uh, obviously is impressed by the recording, he is he's taken it upon himself to now review that recording as part of the theatre review and uh, and so um, so basically um, uh, it is very difficult to try to break into uh, a kind of um, exposure and distribution that uh, my advice to any any people um, uh, budding composers or record label company or label uh, owners or whatever is you really got to do this out of love because you can't say I want to make a record and I'm going to sell a million copies. There's no, there's no way you can. Win. There's no, no outlet now to sell CDs. I mean, streaming is you don't earn anything from streaming. Um, downloads maybe a little bit, but basically, it's really is is something that you need to do um, um, for love. And choosing in terms of choosing a record company to to dis, to, to to distribute your recording. Uh, but like Dan, uh, like Van said, um, it depends on the on the catalog. Uh, over the years, we have, uh, for example, we have built up a formidable um, catalog in that you know we we, we have all the greats, um, uh, uh, both British and American um, composers in our catalog, and that in itself is generating interest and and publicity. Uh, for example. Uh, before anyone can be so my, la my latest last new recording was an American, a Broadway show called Something a Foot. Uh, that's a legendary um, a cult musical from the 70s uh, produced everywhere, but they never made a cast album. And, um, and so the American writers, when they decided they needed an album, uh, a studio cast album to keep it alive, though they got in touch of, with me, a British company, um, and, uh, and it's all because they look at my catalog and they saw 
Kurt Vau, Stephen Sondheim, Kendon F. Rogers and Hammerstein, all these big names, including you know, Sandy Wilson and Julian Slade and, uh, in the catalog. And so they want to put their recording, the studio cast recording, the first recording, in with that crowd. Um, and, um, and so I, I, was very, I was very happy. But so it's important that you should choose a catalog that, that has some kind of interest uh, in the world of musical theatre. You know. Thank you. Thank you, John. Poppy. Um, yeah, I just wanted to add, uh, because again, we're like the young scrappy hungry end of this, uh, and we just put ours out. We used a thing called Ditto, but I think there's a similar thing called TuneCore, and that's just distributed digitally. So we don't have physical copies at all. Although my um, composer and co-lyricist for another of my shows, The Rhythmics, uh, is very keen that when that show has its production, maybe this year, maybe next year, um, that we will that we will like do full on record LPs because it's that sort of a show and it's that kind of demographic. Anyway, fine. Um, but the thing I was going to say is uh, we, um, along with yeah, all of the shows that we 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 have developed and are developing, we have made music videos. Um, so I've talked about this, <laughs> talked elliptically about this one that I can't properly announce. That we will do the entire thing, seven music videos, which will tell the whole story of the well, the, the forty minute version of the show. Um, but particularly. Um, that another show we we cast album we lose last year the the shows maybe only got I don't know it's got like four thousand streams or something on Spotify but the uh, the music video that we have put out on Facebook has had ten thousand views just on Facebook so I mean uh, again because I'm a writer and I'm not particularly <laughs> commercially minded I'm like the thing I care about is reach so the fact that we've reached you know ten thousand people on Facebook alone. I'm like, yes, that's a win. And and on Willows, um, the show that we've just released, uh, one of the characters is deaf and a lot of the show is uh, performed in a kind of integrated British Sign Language and hip hop dance. And so it felt really important. Obviously the cast album is not accessible, particularly accessible to a deaf or hard of hearing audience. So the, we made a music video for that that is features the deaf character and performer and is integrated BSL and captioned, uh, which again, you know, already that's reached several thousand. It's only been out a few weeks and it's reached several thousand people. So music videos, top tip. Wonderful, Fantastic. thank you. Um, did did Fan or Simon want to come in on this question? I, I just realising we've got half an hour and we've got a lot of questions from our lovely audience. So is it all right to move on to them or go on, Simon? I, I'm happy to, to chime in because I know that a lot of the, I know actually a lot of your members personally, and I, I know I know what they're trying to achieve. I suppose exactly like Poppy, exactly like Vicky, that they're pri primarily the writers who just want their work heard and out in the world. Um, and a lot of writers approach me and say, uh, it's something I was sort of touching upon earlier, is about how much should they even spend on a demo. And I think so many brilliant composers can actually do a lot of it in their, in their own homes, in their own bedrooms. I don't think anyone should be spending thousands and thousands of pounds on a demo if it's just about getting people just to hear it in the first instance. Of course, it's different if you're going to go sell it. If you're doing your music, you're writing a disservice. If it's just a basic demo, definitely don't sell it. If it's just about getting people to hear it, that's fine. Uh, the next step for me is always, if it's going on to a concept album, very much like Vicky was talking about, it has a much more, I mean, the budget goes up a little bit, but also your your um, artistic uh, level goes up a little bit. Think, well, I want people to hear this as if it's going to be what they're going to hear on stage. That does cost a bit more, but once again, it shouldn't cost hundreds of thousands of pounds. Um, unless you've got that to spend, because as as John has touched on and Van has said, you, you're never going to make it back. It's got to be for the love of getting your work out there. Um, I think very briefly, just to sort of summate Sinji, um, I, I suppose I'm coming from a, a slightly different angle from everyone, really, is that I'm not a writer. I'm not really a record producer. Um, I'm primarily a theatre director who's just trying to help. And I just kept that going for 11 years. Um, and writers just say, can you help me get this album together? And I, and I do everything I can to work out why and why we should be doing it, how we could do it, and then try and help them get it out there. Um, and I suppose a good example of, of a few MMD writers um, would be uh, like Dougal Irvine and Stuart Matthew Price. Uh, so they're, they're 10 years older now, but 10 years ago, I used to say the next generation of musical theatre writers. But anyway, they both came to me looking to release their work. Because of that release that we did, they've been commissioned to write full musicals. So it was worth them doing the project that I did with them. Um, and other examples of, of small budgets, but doing cast recordings, 
Uh, a good one would be the, um, the Bake Hall Bake Off I did many years ago. It was a college a drama school project, acting musicianship project. They all wrote it. They got it on a, a small fringe theatre and r &H said, oh, we'd like to license this show. Have you got a recording? Of course, they then came to me and said, can you, can you help us do a recording? So that was done on a budget. It was a piano vocal only, but it sold the show so they could get more productions and license the show. And of course, what, what, what Van is talking about is on a much larger scale because it's about the producers wanting to throw their musical around the entire world. What I'm talking about is, is, is small, but it's a start. And I suppose for all your members is to, to work within a budget that is appropriate to what you think you're doing with it. And, and, and as I said, where everyone's got all the, all the ability to probably record a lot from home. So if you're a composer who can do your orchestrations and do all your stems and get your mates to send in your, your band parts, do that before you go into a studio and do vocals. It's gonna save you a fortune. Um, so yeah, that will be my 10 pence worth on. Don't spend hundreds of thousands, really be careful and know what you're doing it for. But also let's just have a shout out for not asking freelancers to work for free. Never. <laughs> and to uh, quickly add to what Simon said, another another way of funding, if you're at a stage where you're courting licensing interest, some of the licensing companies uh, will certainly give an advance. Uh, you may be able to use that for your recording budget, or some of them might even be willing to help finance it because it's in their interest for you to have a recording. Um, we've, we've seen all situations. So something to keep in mind um, that you may be able to you know, tap into that. So certainly, um, um, uh, a major um, uh, licensing uh, 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 company uh, have contributed to several recordings that I've made in New York, uh, uh, Broadway and off Broadway cast recordings, because it's in their interest to have a recording to, to then try to sell and rent out the work uh, for amateur, stock and amateur productions. So that's an avenue to uh, raise um, financing finances for the uh, for your recordings you know and both poppy and vicky have mentioned arts council england project funding sometimes supports uh, recordings also the prs foundation will sometimes you can apply for project funding uh, towards recording uh, and they do support musical theater so that's also a possibility uh, so there are, are some opportunities out there um, as emily was saying we're getting lots of, of questions uh, through the youtube feed so to to pass on to one of those sort of touching on something poppy was just saying about you know you want to pay the the performers uh, even at the, the more modest end of, of the scale. We've got a question from Josh Norman, writer of Sprite, saying, do singers tend to get a fee per song? Uh, I think we're talking about the sort of smaller concept album uh, or, or streaming uh, sort of end of the scale here. And if they're not a big name, what's the average sort of fee per song or whatever? So I see Vicky's ready to jump in and then poppy after her. I can answer that. On Zoological Society, um, we paid MU rates and we paid an MU session fee. So you actually get time. So it's, and so we, we had uh, the, the record label I used managed that time incredibly efficiently. So you pay, uh, I think it's something along the lines of... 280 pounds someone probably might know more but it's something like about Two, 260 260 for six hours or 130 for three hours yes that's it 260 for six hours so we had six hours and we managed to manage to get a, the chorus you know the, we, we had a rehearsal outside of the session which we paid them for so they were all rehearsed and ready to go and then we had six hours so yes you you if you're doing it properly you basically pay them by time um with mu mu rates it's that's a lot cheaper than it is in the state. So I, you know, my my answer probably wouldn't be as helpful. Yeah, but but um, but that's the musician's rate. Um, but for the artists, for the singers, um, I think it's negotiable. Uh, I've experienced um, people doing it for love, up to me paying thousands to um, you know this, the performers. For the musicians, it's a set fixed session rate. 130 for also three. Also fixed for ensemble singers as well, actually, for um for a chorus. You can it's also there's a vocal vocalist rate if you choose to use that. Um yeah, the equity rate, I think. Um the uh, I think it's 130 for three hours, I think. And for and the, copy, the yeah. oh just just to add for the lead vocalists, um, I mean this is a matter of political principle, but we always again we paid by hour uh, on a buyout fee that was higher than the the, the MU rate, but um we it was the same depending like one of our 
um, we're doing a cast EP of uh, The Little Prince, um, with an amazing composer called Candida Caldercott. You've got to check her out. Uh, but the, the our title um, role, The Little Prince, is a complete, like, new grad, graduated last year, hasn't done a thing. You know, he's on the same rate as Clive Rowe, who's on uh, Willows and on another thing. But, oh, no, I'm not there to really forget, forget I said that thing. It's on YouTube. Oh, yeah. Someone else talk now. It's called Favoured Nations. Uh, we paid everyone. <laughs> we paid everyone on Favoured Nations as well on the Zoological Society. All the principals were on the same money. But yeah. Good, yes. good, good. Favoured Nations is a very useful tool to have. I mean, I have worked with big international superstars, film stars, but I've always used the Favoured Nations as this is what everybody gets. Mm. And you'd be amazed how um, big names, Hollywood names, if they want to do the project and make the recording, they'll do it because money is no object to them. So favorite nations is a really good uh, thing to use. And you keep doing it, you don't, you, don't, you don't try to pay someone more secretly because they do talk. And mm. as long as you, you have that one rate that everybody gets, then you, 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 you can get big, big, big names for peanuts really. Great. Thank you. We've got a question from Vicky Hare, who's a composer, um, asking about um, how how perfect an album needs to be. Um, you know, should we be spending thousands um, to record orchestra singers? Um, can we get away with a live performance and the energy of live performance? Um, what, what do people think about that? Was my hand up first? I'm just going to jump in. Um, I just want to, to make a shout out for the sound engineers doing the mixing and the mastering, because I think that is where the absolute, that's where perfection comes in. And what, you know, you can do things. I know that there are people who've done things, well, a bit like Simon was saying, Flowers Mrs. Harris, where it's live and on stage, or whether it's in the studio or any combination. I think the key is having brilliant uh, engineer mixing and mastering, and that because that's where it really, you take it to the next level. So I have to shout out to the two people that we use all the time, Simon Small, who's done four of our five shows, and Sam Featherstone, who did In the Willows, and also did six. So a lot of people were like, oh, it's got kind of six Halton vibes. I'm like, yes, because it's the same engineer as on six. Great. Thank you, si first. Simon. Sorry, I think Simon was next. Then Vicky? Uh, yes, the answer to the question, no, I don't think you should spend thousands. It really comes down to what do you want to release and how what sort of quality do you want to release so a good example we always say oh the original contact album jesus christ superstar i presume you can't do a piano vocal only jesus christ superstar you probably need to do the rock score and i would always say whatever project comes my way if it's a demo or a concept album i say how big do we need to realize this and and therefore how much is that going to cost so once again, if you've got a big budget and you can pay that, go for it. But I, I don't think you'll ever see it back. And sometimes producers don't need to hear all of that to hear writing. Uh, it, it depends on the project. And as I said earlier about licensing, um, a review show called A Spoonful of Sherman started as a piano and four singers. And the, the, the creator and writer said, can we record this? I said, yeah. And it's gone on to have a slightly larger life, but it started as piano vocal only. Um, Ushers, which is a, a show that recorded actually, and Vicky mentioned uh, Auburn Jam, they recorded it, the, the team wanted me to release it, and it was done with piano vocal, they kept it really simple, simple as that. Uh, yeah, so that will be my, my, my answer. Vicky, did you want to... Damn, um, it's all right. Oh. <laughs> well, actually, uh, John? I, sorry, I, um, yeah, I'm in a slightly different boat because we, uh, we deal with international and and we, are, we have to compete with the commercial uh, uh, market uh, with the major labels. In fact, I've licensed a lot of recordings to BMG and EMI. A lot of people don't realize now, actually my recordings, but they come out on Sony and EMG, you know, they belong to me. Uh, but I have got no choice but to do big, uh, big productions, you know, with big orchestras and stars and things like that, just to maintain the, 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 the um, uh, image of our label. But, but it's true, Simon, you don't need to spend a lot of money um, to, um, to sell your work, but sometimes you really need to depend on, on what level you want to maintain your, um, your presence. Uh, one thing just to add into that, see, seeing the question again, is about the live question. Um, I'm, I've only released one or two live albums, but it, it, but it is a definitely a cost-effective way of doing it, as long as your engineer and sound team are completely set up and prepped and you potentially have two or three performances to take live. 
Uh, a good example from my catalogue is Imaginary, which once again was a Stuart Matthew Price commission via NYMT. He said, can we record it? I said, if we can record three off the sound desk, we'll take all the stems, we'll clean them all, we'll mix it all, and then you can release the London cast recording based on a live performance. And that was the most cost effective because we didn't have to set anything up bar my engineer plugging into the soundboard and making sure the stems are coming through. So I definitely recommend if you're looking to do a concert of your new emerging piece of writing, and you may as well go, could we add a tiny bit more to the budget and get everything off the sound desk? And you'll see a lot of new London cast recordings are being done live because it's, it's actually more cost effective because you don't have all that setting up cost. You will have the cost of paying musicians and the cast, but that's something, once again, you could negotiate. Uh, so yes, I would recommend if you're going to do a concert, because I know there's a lot of uh, social uh, buzz about, oh, we're going to do a concert of our new show. I would go, great, see if you can get the setup to get it off, off the sound desk so you can clean it and have, have your cast recording. That would be my advice and suggestion. And ben, ben, you'll be able to say something, because I don't think live recordings is cheaper in America. In fact, it's not. expensive <laughs> doing live recordings in, in America, isn't it? No, um, especially in a theater, because then there you have to pay stagehands and others that you wouldn't normally pay. Um, if we have done a couple live cast albums at 54 Below that we've done, you know, which is a, like a cabaret venue. So we've done them more as like concerts and that can be a cost effective. But the thing I would add or enhance of what Simon said is it's not enough to just get it off the board. It has to be conceived from the beginning that you're going to be doing that because the mix that you're giving to your crowd is not necessarily this has the same needs for miking and other elements that you would when you're doing a recording for example if everyone has wireless mics or um you know and other elements and if you if they're performing their their vocal performance might not be as strong because they may be concentrating on their choreography or their movement um if it's a concert that lends itself a little bit better than like a actual performance um but i would make sure that you're working with your engineer very closely to make sure that you have everything individually tracked so that you can tune and edit and do whatever you need to do. Because if you just have a stereo mix, essentially, uh, when you're done, then you really have nothing you can work with unless you're going advanced level, like what John was talking about earlier, where he takes two tracks and reverse engineers them. But that's, that's a much higher level that most engineers don't know how to do. And you need special uh, software and equipment for that. I, I tend to have just two engineers uh, all my life, I've worked with two engineers and they know exactly what I want and what I need. I don't need to go through the whole thing with them. So basically it's important to find good engineers and stick with them. And then they'll know what you want and what your needs are and your requirements, you know. Thank you. And we've had a few questions about distribution generally and also streaming. So I'll sort of combine two questions here. We might go to, to Vicky and Poppy first in terms of the streaming end. So in terms of where you're not working with a record label to distribute your recording, can you tell us a little bit about what platforms you found are useful? Where are people discovering your work where it's being mostly downloaded or streamed? And then we'll ask Van, John and, and Simon to talk in terms of the, the sort of why, why people might work with with, with your labels in terms of distribution of a recording, uh, that sort of end of the spectrum. So to Vicky first. Yeah, we, we've put it out on absolutely everything. So all, all streaming platforms, uh, including uh, ad free on YouTube, actually. So all the tracks are, uh, I think, I don't, I think they just, Auburn Jam just sent it out to whatever, like the everything is. So it's like Spotify, uh, Apple Music, Tidal, all of them. Um, the best one is Spotify. And I think mainly because the platform works like Facebook, the platform's like a, like a social media platform where you get graphics and you can interact with the person. And, you know, I, I think there's a bit more usability to the app. So I think, I feel like people, uh, uh, people find it and playlisting is huge. I made a massive mistake uh, and, and don't, don't do this. Cause one of the things I had to do for the first time for myself was create myself a Spotify profile. And when your music is released for the first time, you have to put it into a, into a category and there actually wasn't there isn't a musical theater category on spotify and and the trouble is, is that so many streams come through playlisting and this was where this is this this was my error and i wish i'd had some more guidance or read up about it a bit more i put it in the wrong genre it doesn't end up on a playlist and then you're missing out on loads of organic like you're you're missing out basically what you want to get it on is some kind of like easy listening or music to listen to in the shower or like uplifting tunes you want to try and get it into that spotify 
I you, you do because that's how people that people that don't know um don't know your work so that 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 I learned that the hard way unfortunately and we'll have to make sure I'm better at that next time around really but that's only from my personal profile I think it was submitted in better ways via others but that was my that was my experience of um streaming platforms so yeah we similar in terms of uh spotify you know itunes all of those things and yeah as i say we used a a, a platform called ditto which did all that for us and the equivalent is TuneCore, which i think is maybe more popular in america um yes just to speak on the playlist thing so i <laughs> i personally stalk to load so there are quite a few musical theater playlists some of which have quite a lot of listeners so i just personally try to find them on social media and be like hi i've written this thing have a listen if you like it i'd love you to like listen to this song i think it'd be really good for this playlist um and a lot of them didn't reply but some of them did um and there's one very lovely person who has now put songs from three of my different albums onto her playlists so uh it's good to do a bit of legwork but i think yeah vicky's right spotify it, there is this sort of organic growth vibe to it. Um, and you get this sense that particularly if you've got multiple shows, you know, I think they piggyback off each other because people listen to that thing and they go, oh, what else have they done? So, yeah. Brilliant. And can we go over to Van then? And before we go to also Simon and, and John, Van, tell us about how how would the, the partnership with Broadway Records work in terms of if uh, there was already a recording of, of someone's musical and they wanted to approach Broadway Records, what, what would the, the relationship be like? Um, well, at that point, we're acting more as a distributor and a promotional partner um, rather than helping plan the recording. Um, we do that quite often. You know, a good chunk of our recordings are brought to us nearly finished. We usually are involved still in doing the package design and getting it out in the world and setting everything up. But it just depends on, you know, what they bring us, uh, at what stage it's at. Um, so we can really fit in on any stage, whether it's from the before it's even recorded to it's being, you know, completely done um, it's anywhere in between. So that's easy. Um, I used to be a little bit more against streaming on day one. Um, I think I think John still is, um, and I understand because it pays so so little. Um, but uh, I found more and more that I don't feel like there's as much crossover between Spotify and iTunes. So I used to worry that we'd be cannibalizing our iTunes sales by doing Spotify in the beginning, and I think that's become less of an issue because I think a lot of people who are on one are not on the other, or at least not as prevalently. Um, and you can make money on Spotify. You just have to have a lot of streams before it amounts to anything. You know, it's something like point, uh, zero. Well, it's like four tenths of a cent per stream. So you can do the math that it's going to take a while to make your budget back if you're relying on streaming only. Um, but you know, it's, it's certainly a great promotional tool and you will get a lot more listens that way, but you just won't make as much money per unit, but hopefully over time it will add up. Oh, thank you. Anything further on distribution from Simon or John? John, you said? For, for, for us, it's very, very different because we, um, uh, we've, been, we've been doing it for a long time now, 40, 40 years, 40 odd years. Um, we, uh, my catalog is more about the, uh, the pre preservation and the promotion and exposure of musical theatres, um, the, the, the greats, and to keep, it, keep them alive. So basically, uh, we are not really so much into exposure and, and, and making money and things like that. We're just putting it out there. Uh, distribution is almost non-existent now in terms of um, trying to sell a CD or whatever. Even if you put it on, uh, on downloads on iTunes or Spotify, uh, unless you are high profiled, your audience is not going to find you because they got so got millions of songs and millions of names that they, they, they search for first. You have to expose yourself and, and somehow you need to expose yourself in different mediums in different ways to direct people to, uh, to, to search for you on, uh, on streaming. I'm not a big supporter as a van knows of streaming, but, uh, but we have put our foot uh, put a little bit in it and um, you know, we are on streaming. But, um, but um, it, it's, it's basically direct, direct marketing now. Um, we find that we've been very successful building, building our own base and, and exposing ourselves and finding new people to directly sell to them and to, 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 uh, to um, interact with them. And to uh, Facebook, for example, is a great tool 
uh, you, 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 you build up your audience, you build up your, your, your likes, you make an announcement and they get shared and more people hear about your new releases than anything else, you know, by just making an announcement on Facebook. Uh, but you need to find your audience first. So, um, so there's no easy route in terms of distribution and things like that. It's the, it's the hard slog out there now. I mean, to think that, to think that there was a time when, when I licensed um, the rink with Liza Minnelli and Cheetah Rivera, the Broadway cast, to Polygram. The, the ship of Polygram was 150,000 units you know, of that cast album. Now, I think we'd be very happy if we ship out 500 units. You know, indeed. And Simon, what was the sort of approach to, to marketing and distribution yeah. for, for um, well, recordings? Simji, you'll be surprised to know that Simji doesn't have any marketing. <laughs> we don't have any budget. Uh, Simji is literally me. <laughs> um, so when I'm working with a, a writer or a producer of a show, or it's a partnership. I work with them. I'm, I'm only helping them to get their work out there. Just distribution is, is really hard. When, when the label started to grow and pretty quickly, it took me by surprise, I approached uh, leading distributors in the UK and the, the figures just didn't add up. Um, I mean, uh, well, to put it into perspective, I mean, Simji, a limited press, the smallest I can do in replication is a thousand units, you know, and we're talking a niche market, we'll be lucky to shift anywhere near a thousand. So you go, well, so then you have to go, why are we pressing CDs? So, and then, and the, the, as I said, the cost didn't add up with the distributor because they take so much off, off the sale price that I couldn't even return anything to the writer. So as I said, I work with, I work with the writers uh, like a partnership and I say, we sell this together. I'll do everything I can that you can recoup. Um, inevitably over the last, and it's only really over the last couple of years for me, where the writers of course have said, well, we need to go digital, which I agree. I don't, I, I'm with John that, that I, I can't do streaming. I'm, I'm still old fashioned. I still buy CDs. I mean, I'm not that old, but I'm old enough. I still buy CDs. And, I, and the reason we, we still press CDs, even, even as I said, it's a niche market with a very small audience for new musical theatre writing in the UK, is the writers have something tangible to give to people. They can say, here's my libretto and here's my concept album or cast recording. Have a listen, have a read. Digital is a little bit harder. You're asking people to open up an email, read it on a computer, download all the, all the tracks. It seems to not work that way. So we still press physical CDs, but now we're only pressing, you know, hundreds, definitely not thousands. And distribution wise, the physical product, I rely on Dress Circle. You know, it was a physical shop. It's now literally a, you know, a fledgling, you know, uh, online shop. I'm doing everything I can to try and promote them and say, hey, you can get the whole Sinji Records catalogue at Dress Circle. It's a bit like, head, you know, uh, bashing your head against a brick wall. But I do believe there are still fans and theatre enthusiasts and, and champions of writing who want to own a physical, physical product. And if they want a digital product, then I, I always recommend my writers, uh, Poppy's mentioned, I, I always recommend TuneCore because it's the biggest. But I normally only say stick with iTunes or Amazon and try and recoup off, off those downloads. If you stream, you won't see any of it back. Um, you know, but I always give you know suggest that as a, as an idea. But distribution, as, as John said, is is really hard. It's not my forte. I wish it were. I wish I get these albums out to billions of people. But you know, yeah, <laughs> that's the way. Can I just tip back in and say that I don't think there'd be a world in which I would consider pressing a physical CD. Um, I don't. I just don't think so. I just. I. I can't see it. I. I don't have any in my house anymore. Um, I'm sure there's lots of people like me. Um, I can't. I, I. I just couldn't see it. And I know we're talking about recouping and wanting to sell. I had lots of people when Zoological Society was released. I had lots of people want to buy it to make sure that like like I'd rather buy it, and that's fine. I think there's lots of people still like that that would rather buy it. But you. Ha I think the main question is is that what is your album for? Um, and the reason why it's out on streaming, it's out on YouTube ad free, is that that album now is going to bring me fans into my into the show when it goes up on stage. It's going to, people are going to know it. They're going to know some of the songs and they're going to come and buy a ticket. And then also, it already has got me loads of other work, and that's it. The quality of that recording and the fact that that sh that show now and that recording is like my that 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 is like my work. It's my best work, and it's the best work I've got online. And it was worth the time and worth the effort. And that, and that, and now, and now that's that. So, from a from a composer's point of view, I think your platform is to do with: do you want to actually make some money back, or does it not matter? Has it come from elsewhere? Is it stuff that's funding, and is it to then 
sort of kickstart your career. Um, I think that's all I have to really add about the choice of physical stuff. So, Vicky, obviously you and I both have had the support of the Arts Council, which puts us in a great position where we can be yeah. like, we don't need to make money, we just want to reach people. Um, but that, but there is a gen bit of a generational divide here because I think it's true that there is a huge, and we haven't even talked about TikTok and TikTok musicals and all of that whole Brave New World, um, but there is a, you know, growing, like, super young digital native generation of musical theatre lovers who, I mean, yeah, I'm having really interesting conversations about how do you do the TikTok thing and putting tracks of your music out so people can do the duet thing. I don't understand TikTok, I'm too old for that, but, you know, that is the future. We've got one question. It could be quite a quick question, I think, um, because we've been asked, well, the panel have been asked, what do you think about the kind of drip feed of here's a song and then here's another song, or is it much better to say, here's my album, I've got, I've got the whole thing ready. Any thoughts on that? Here's my album, 100%. My, my concept album is 45 minutes long. People, people, most people I think have sat, sat down and listened to it in one go, for sure. The yeah, music right. videos is different. Drip feed your videos because then you can keep the album up in the air, like once a month, like keep, keep it going. But yeah, get the whole album out. Thank you, Vicky. John? There are two avenues uh, down this route. Uh, one, if you're a composer and a writer and you want to expose your work, I think your best chances are streaming. But if you want to have your work um, uh, bought and appreciated and listened by people who just want to listen to, to, to it, uh, to, to your score, then you have to try to sell it because um, you have to cultivate your base, your audience. And it's not audience for your work, but the audience to buy physical CD that Simon is serving. Because, um, because collectors and people who want to buy who want to buy CDs and collect and, and, and amass, they have been born every day. It's not like, like suddenly you just, you just get to the end of them. Today, right this very minute, there is a collector or at least several collectors been born around the world. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Simon. <laughs> There'll be another few collectors born and they'll just grow up and, and, they'll, and they'll carry on for as long as you offer, offer uh, uh, CDs or collectibles to them, they will buy. I mean, we have been very successfully uh, cultivating and, and building our collective space. I know that I can, I can actually get confidently sell so many CDs on every releases of ours because we have a brand recognition now amongst our, our base and it's growing and we're growing more. So every time when we release something, I know there are a few hundred people there who will just buy them, you know. Whatever. Simon. Uh, yes, I was just going to add to just sort of back up why 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 Simji still presses CDs and 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 if we're going with a concept album or or cast recording, a lot of a lot of people tend to say, how do we know what the whole story is if we're just getting a Spotify mixtape or um, and I get that as well, which is why I, you know I'm certainly I'm proud with the booklets that accompany the, the Simji Records is that they're a comprehensive booklet that explains the synopsis, the story, sometimes the full you know, full lyrics or libretto. So if it's about selling the whole show, the listener can enjoy it and read it all at the same time. And I appreciate you can get that with digital if you if you buy on iTunes and you get the digital booklet, but not all platforms do that. And and obviously I appreciate if you're streaming, you might stream one track and then disappear, but you know, if you get the whole album, you understand it's a story to be told. So it's a bit, once again, it all comes down to, and Vicky mentioned this, what it's, what it's for and what you're trying, how you're, tr what you're selling. Brilliant. We, we've got some other questions here, but I realise we're out of time. Uh, what do we think, Emily? We, do we want to keep going a little bit? How are people placed for time? We, we're very aware of Zoom fatigue and, and people will often, but there again, we'll, we'll post this online and people may dip in and out and come back and continue. I think one of the main areas of questions that we haven't yet been able to put to the panel if we're, we're sort of closing things up was around the sort of the, the concept recording. If, if you're releasing content early on in the development of a show and it continues to develop and we've already mentioned the concept recording of, of Jesus Christ Superstar is one of the the most famous or Evita they're the the sort of big famous examples I guess that the material is going to continue to to change and yet we all know that Six is a, a, a recent British example where the the recordings are the way that most people discovered that musical uh, and that was mostly through Spotify and streaming um, but then 
people are the question that people are placing is what if the show continues to change are there problems about releasing the material too early in a recorded form and then the artistic concept perhaps continuing to change is that detrimental to the way the project will then be received or its chances of having a full production are there any thoughts on that yeah so obviously poppy and i probably got the same sort of just uh uh mine mine is don't release at all um there's there's 12 songs on the zoological society album and there's another 15 in the show so there's more than half not released um it allows you and also i deliberately chose those songs so that there's some story missing there's an entire character missing not on the album that's a surprise so the through line of the story the amount of tech the amount of tweets and messages that i get i've got a song i suppose the most popular song is called marvin sung by lucy jones and it's about penguin that goes missing and the amount of tweets that i get about where is marvin like loads of people constantly just where is it? and if she, she sings it a lot in like online concerts and stuff and so and that's great because that is the story and i'm not telling people what that is so there's something left that's why i've not got a digital booklet i've not done all that i've, I've decided to just not not like to leave people something to left so that's why I, my advice would be don't put it all out there because then you can let it change so just to quickly add to that um uh which is maybe an error one of the cast uh albums we've released from a show called house fire which actually was in i think i saw that pen a performance of that penguin song and i think that was one of the inspirations for house fire um it's a it's a gig theater musical where a trio of endangered animals kind of protest the climate crisis anyway we have already in a workshop rewritten partly rewritten one of the songs that is in the ep so that's going to live there on the ep and then people will see the show and they'll be like half of that song is that and half of that song is a different song but i'm just like it's an evolving thing that's fine there'll be songs the the, the nature of that show because they're a, they're a band will release songs that aren't even in the show so i think you know you put it out there you think it's going to be there it will change it will evolve the same with willows you know these six songs three of them are brand new by the time we come to do the production at uh, theater in two years time uh, they might have changed again but i think you know it's still fine to put stuff out there I think Heather's is a great example. The, the two recordings of that are really quite different and that's fine. I think audiences like stuff that changes and like, and like, I, I think it's, don't hide it. Great. Or you, or you can release a uh, re remastered, re-release with bonus tracks. <laughs> Indeed, bonus, bonus tracks, lovely, yeah. Um, I think we need to bring it to an end there, partly because um, Simon's children, are, it's their bedtime, and that's very important, and Poppy's children. Um, so thank you so You're much, right. everyone. Bye. Thank you. Um, and for our lovely audience, we're going to ask you um, for feedback, please, if you have a moment, that would really help us. Um, and thank you so much to this wonderful panel. Um, really interesting, so much more to be discussed. So we will keep talking to people and please, audience, keep in touch with us. And a very big thank you and bye-bye from us all. Thank you so much to our panellists. Thanks for joining us. Bye-bye.